Good morning, Thrive family. Let's all stand. And we are in the presence of the King. Let us worship Him in one voice, in one family. Raise a hallelujah.
with us today leading and our team here and great to see all of you this morning welcome to thrive church we're so glad to have all of you here in person whether it's your first time or you were here since the beginning we're so glad that you're here today and we welcome all of you online as well hey i want to share a psalm with you it's called uh, a psalm for giving grateful praise psalm 100 listen to what it says shout for joy all the earth Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are the people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. We come to worship a faithful and a loving God this morning. Wherever you're coming from, whatever burden you have on your plate, however many plates you feel like you might be spinning, even if a few have dropped this week, I want you to know that you come into a place today where you are embraced with an incredible love. Not just love from people in a church, but love from your creator God who is for you, who is pulling for you, who wants to see you walk closer and closer with him so that you can walk through this life confident, without fear, sensing his peace and his power work in your life. So today, as that, that psalm ends, it says he is faithful through all generations. We're going to talk about connecting to those prior generations and the power that comes when we connect with our spiritual ancestors. God is a God who's seen it all before, friends. There's nothing new you can throw at him. He's been down that path generation after generation, and he knows how to bring you through whatever you're facing. So would you just bring your worship to him, humbly lay it all at his feet, and let him fill you with his strength and with his power today. Let's enter his gates with praise and thanksgiving. within you. Let's declare his goodness.
us here today to remind us of your grace, your love. For we know where the spirit of the Lord is. There's freedom. Lord God, every person that is here today, every child of God, every kingdom citizen, may we receive the good word, the message of good news, so that as we remain in faith, in hope and love, may we declare your praise every second of our lives, for we are living sacrifices, we are not dead, but alive in you. Thank you, Lord, for we rejoice in the truth of the resurrection, the truth of restoration and redemption. God, to you be the glory, to you be the honor, and speak to us today. We are your children. We are your children. You are a good father. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Church said, Amen. 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 Please be seated. Yeah, let's give him praise this morning. Amen. I'm so thankful for these guys. Those in middle school and high school, you can go ahead and be dismissed to your class. We're excited about what the, uh, the Cassandra and Jonathan have prepared for you guys today, and I'm excited about what God's going to continue to do in this room. I, I'm thankful for these volunteers who work hard every, each all through the week doing what they do and then leverage so much of their time and their commitment to lead us in worship each week, and, and it's uh, just a blessing to have them here. Now, hey... This morning, we're going to continue our 23 and Me series. You might say our 2023 and Me series. And we've already seen as we started this that it's really good to know your spiritual DNA. Like it helps to know your identity in Christ. We started by seeing that you are made in the image of God. And when you know who you are and whose you are and that God has created you to be like him, it motivates you to want to become more and more like Jesus, to walk in his steps. And then last week we talked about how uh, knowing our, our spiritual DNA helps us understand our health de predispositions, right? That we have this tendency towards sin, but thank God through his grace, he gives us the double cure. Not only can he save us from our sin and give us the promise of heaven, but he washes the sin out of us day by day as he sanctifies us and makes us holy through his spirit living in us. It's the double cure for our sin. And today I want us to think about uh, our spiritual history, how understanding our spiritual genealogy how understanding our DNA and who has gone before us, how it can strengthen us with courage and faith to become the people God is calling us to be as his church and as individual sons and daughters of his. So I'm excited to talk more about that. Now, you know, one of the key purposes of any DNA test is to understand your people, right? Your tribe, where you come from. Like, who, who, what your genealogy is all about. I looked a little bit into my genealogy. One of the things I found I was really excited about, my hometown, Williamstown, Kentucky, named after a, a relative, William Arnold, of mine. And that, that was kind of fun. It's like, hey, that, that my hometown's named after a relative, you know. But I looked a little bit deeper, and uh, I stopped looking. <laughs> because, man, everybody's got some of those cousins, right? That, that scare you a little bit. But it's important to know your, your genealogy, it can inform you in such meaningful ways and powerful ways about uh, where you come from and, and who you are and what you're about. Kind of know where you are on your family tree. So this morning, I've asked Randy Tennyson to come and share with us a little bit of his story. Randy and Kim have been with us from almost the very beginning of the church. Their son, Charlie, works back in our sound booth. And Randy just stepped up to serve as a ministry leader in our production ministries here. Um, he's been a part of the band for a long time. But Randy is going to share with us a little bit about his story and why it's important to know your genealogy. So Randy, thanks for sharing with us today. Let's give Randy a big thrive welcome this morning. Thanks. I will tell you that... Uh, I admire you because these lights are hot, and this is the second shirt I've put on, and I've already started sweating <laughs> through this one. Um, Greg asked me to talk about kind of my history. So to let you guys know, I was adopted. Uh, I was given up for adoption as an infant and was adopted by a couple out in California. I was born in Santa Barbara, California. And I was uh, adopted by a couple out there, and uh, 
was uh, it was formalized uh, about a, when I was a year old. I think we have a photo of what we call my gotcha day. Look at that cute kid. I know what you're saying. What happened? I don't know. That's, that's a few Oreos ago. But uh, yeah, that was my gotcha day. That's the day they went to court uh, to actually finalize my adoption. So that's very cool. Um, being adopted, you know, I had great parents. My folks were wonderful. Oh, by the way, uh, p parents don't always have one person take the photos because I don't have a lot of photos of my mom. She's taking the photo right there. So make sure you switch it up or get somebody to take photos of you when you have the kids. Um, but when you're adopted, there's a lot of things that you miss out on. Uh, as you said, I didn't know what my history was. I didn't know what my ethnicity was. You know, what holidays do I celebrate? Do I celebrate Cinco de Mayo? Do I celebrate uh, Oktoberfest? Do I celebrate uh, St. Patrick's Day? In college, I celebrated them all. Okay, but um, uh, but you don't know what is your nationality. What 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 is your makeup? When you go to the doctor's office and you go to a new doctor and they make you fill out that form and the form says, does your mother or father have any of these conditions? I have no idea. Do I have cancer in my, in my family? Do I have heart disease? Do I have some weird disease in my family that I don't know about? Always had to f just kind of leave that blank and then after a while I just started writing adopted and the doctors would quit asking. But uh, there was always that little openness in me. I didn't know who I was. And so after my parents passed, I didn't do anything while they were alive because I didn't want to dishonor them or anything, but I started kind of looking into it. And I found out that California has what's called a birth registry. Every birth in California is, is logged in a birth registry by county by day. So I was able to get mine. I looked it up in Santa Barbara. And all the kids that were born on the same day as I was in, in that county, there were 11. And so I started thinking, well, I'm on there. My name's on there, but that was added after I was adopted because obviously it's a different name. I wonder if they took my birth name off there. So I started going through. Since I knew the full name and date of birth, it was pretty simple to start eliminating people. I found this person exists, this person exists, this person exists. I got through 10 of them. The 11th one, I couldn't find. Didn't know if that person existed. Couldn't find any proof. So that was either me or somebody who died when they were young. Name was Dennis P. Johnston. And the mother's name was Dietz. Hmm, okay. So maybe I'm Dennis P. Johnson. Dennis with one N, which made it a lot easier to look up, by the way. So I started doing a little bit more research. And I found a person called a search angel. This is a person online who their whole hobby is just helping people find their birth parents. And she was able to look in some extra documents and was able to say, okay, your birth father's name is Dennis Patrick Johnston. We found that. And your mother's maiden name, all I can get is Dietz. But I can prove that. Okay, so I know their name, I know where they live, Santa Barbara. And so the next thing I did was I contacted the library because they used to have something called a, uh, a city directory. Kind of like a phone, booth, but a phone book, but it was much more uh, intense in the 60s. It actually had their name, their address, and their occupation. Hmm. So I was able to start looking in there. I also researched and found out that I could ask my adoption agency for non-identifying information. So I asked them, and they sent me back a document that kind of told the story of my parents, but without any names or anything specific in there. It was all very generic. But I found out that my father was, was Irish. He was a uh, carpenter, and he had been hurt. He had injured his back. And my birth mother was a secretary. And she had several brothers and sisters. One brother uh, worked in a foreign country for the U.S. government, it said. That will be important here. So I started looking through that city directory, and I looked up, and very quickly I found Dennis Patrick Johnston Carpenter. Okay, I think, I think I'm on the right path here. I think that's probably him. Then I looked up, all I had was Dietz. So I start going through all the Dietzes, and I look down, and I find Mary Jean Dietz, car uh, Secretary, the Carpenters Union. Okay, now we're good. So... Uh, Started doing some research on them, looked up Mary Jean. Uh, unfortunately, they had both passed away. Uh, Dennis passed in 72, she passed in 91. So there was no chance of actually meeting them, but I did find out that there were a couple of siblings of my mother still alive. And so I, uh, one night, I don't know where the courage came from, but I cold called one of my aunts. Uh, and I... Uh, 
called her and I said, hi, uh, you don't know me. Her name was Janet. I said, but um, I've been doing an adoption search and I think your sister was my birth mother. And what she said next will stay with me forever. She said, I remember you. I remember you. I almost adopted you. But we thought it would be a little weird for your aunt to be your mom and your mom to be your aunt. So I didn't, but I remember you. And she suddenly started pouring out into me all this information about them, all this amazing information. I got photos. Uh, here's a photo of the two birth parents that I was able to find. That's the only photo I could find of my birth father that was actually, he was, he was from Ireland. He was an Irish immigrant, came over as a carpenter, a little bit of a scoundrel. He was married when he fathered me. And uh, shortly after I was born, he, he divorced and he married another woman. That's the only picture I found, and that's from the wedding announcement of the other woman he married that he very quickly divorced afterwards. So a little bit of a scoundrel. But my mother's side just poured out information. Janet became like a pseudo-grandmother to my son, Charlie. She just started sending us information as much as, as she could. Found out I have a half-brother. And she got us in contact with him. So now I have a half-brother. Here's a photo of us together. And don't know if there's a resemblance, but I'll let you judge that. All of a sudden, I have a family. All of a sudden, I know who I am. All of a sudden, I have this half-brother. I've got this amazing niece I got to meet who, who is teaching English in Korea who just got married this past weekend to a Korean bass player. Okay, we are, we are related, but, you know, this is all still just based on an inve investigation. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's something that wasn't right. But then Ancestry DNA, we use that. And all of a sudden, one day, I got these results back. And the DNA connected me as a first cousin to uh, a gentleman named Andrew Johnston in Ireland, who I knew from research was the son of my birth father's brother. So I've, I've proven the Irish lineage. And uh, it also showed me a uh, first cousin was somebody last name Dietz, who I know is, is my first cousin. And so I know now. I, it's filled in that part of me. If you look up here, it even tells you where you're from. All of a sudden, I found out I'm ha I am half Irish, 50% Irish, 26% Swedish. Ooh, hey, I didn't know that. And all this other stuff. And it really does help you know who you are. Now, you bet I'm out there wearing green on St. Patrick's Day. So it really does uh, impact and fill in when you know who you are and when you know what your lineage is. Um, the other thing that happened was um, we adopted my son. Uh, we adopted him from Russia. But the cool thing is we were able to get a lot of information about him. So he knows all about his lineage. He knows what his uh, ancestry is. But uh, So hopefully he won't have that, that question like I did. So, yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah, let's show Randy our appreciation. Thank you for sharing your story. We love you, man. It's awesome. Isn't it great to get to hear his journey? And I, I think it's so touching because I know Randy and his son Charlie, have they've been able to talk about some of the things they have in common with uh, parents who brought them into their home and through adoption. And it's a very, very powerful, powerful thing. And so when you see Randy in green on St. Patty's Day, you'll know why that he's sporting the green. So if he's not wearing it, let's make sure right now we prepare ourselves to pinch him, right? He's the one guy that should get the pinch. Um, I really appreciate Randy sharing that. You know, that your DNA connects you to your history. And knowing your history can motivate you, can ins not just inform you, but it can inspire you to maximize your potential to become all you were meant to be. And, and I think that's especially true of us who are believers when we connect with our spiritual ancestry. Now, on one occasion, Jesus was talking with the Pharisees, and they were feeling pretty prideful about their biological father, Abraham, who's the father of faith. And they're like, well, we are Abraham's children. We've got a special place in the heart of God. 
you know, in the covenant, in the promise. And, and they were feeling really good about who they were as sons of Abraham. And Jesus looked at these leaders in, in the Jewish tradition in first century Jerusalem when he lived, and he said, look, I can raise up from these stones sons of Abraham. It's a powerful teaching. And you know what? In, in a sense, God has done that because in his word, he tells us how all of us, even those of us who are Gentiles, who are not biologically descended from Abraham, we as well have become children of Abraham through our faith, God says. Through faith, we become sons and daughters of Abraham. So we're grafted into our spiritual family through faith in God. And it's a powerful thing because when we look back at our spiritual DNA and our history as people who are believers in Christ, man, we see that we come from a long, long line of faith in God. We see that we stand on the shoulders of some mighty men and women of faith, some incredibly inspirational people who, who encourage us and challenge us to be all we can be for the glory of God and the good of the people around us. And so one of the great passages in all the Bible about those who've gone before us in faith is what I call the hall of faith. Not the hall of fame, but the hall of faith. And it's Hebrews chapter 11. And Hebrews chapter 11 begins naming, beginning with Abraham, all of in Sarah, these great people of faith and how they serve God. And I want to pick that passage up about, about halfway through this morning with you. Let's look together at Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 32, and read of some of the superheroes of our faith. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned into strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released." so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while others still chained were put into prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. Wow. One reason I love Hebrews 11, the hall of faith, is that it gives us this incredible sense of our identity, brothers and sisters. Our identity as people of faith. Sometimes we're tempted to kind of tiptoe through our society, you know, trying not to offend others. And it's wise to be thoughtful in the way that we express our faith. But friends, God does not identify you with the timid. God identifies us with heroes of faith. He calls us to live in power and in victory, just as those who went before us did, not in fear, but in faith. That's how they lived. And we have, when we have the faith to live God's way in this world, as hostile as the world might be toward God's ways, then it enables us, through his power, to make a real impact on the lives of those around us for their good and for God's glory. And I think we see in this passage that we've just read three ways that our faith, our faith fleshes out when we stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before us, when we connect with our spiritual ancestry, when we remember we come from a long line of faith. How does that faith flesh out according to their example? Well, first, we see faith fleshes out with courage to do something beyond myself. Look again what it says in verse 33 who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, became powerful in battle, routed foreign armies. When we trust God, then he's able to work in our lives in a way that, that can make a difference, friends, in this world way bigger than just ourselves, right? We, we understand when we live by faith, we're living for something much more important than just our own little kingdom, 
than our own little world. When I'm only concerned about my life, my kingdom, myself, you know what happens? I begin to, to oftentimes pity myself. Because when things don't go my way, I mean, self-pity can creep in. This is true with all humanity. In fact, we see it in the first guy mentioned in our passage, Gideon. Now, Gideon's story is found in, the, in Judges chapter 6 and 7 in the Bible. The people of Israel have been oppressed for years by the Midianites. And one of the things that they're doing is they're stealing their crops from them. And so Gideon's he's in a, a cave hiding out from the Midianites. He, and he's stomping his grapes so that they won't see uh, you know, the fruit of his labor and come steal it. And, and so the people of God are crying out to the Lord to deliver them from the hand of the Midianites. And so God decides to deliver them. And he calls this man named Gideon. He's the man God has chosen to deliver his people from the brutality of this foreign people. And so Gideon, here's God's angel, call him up to go deliver his people. But Gideon is overcome with self-doubt. And the tough times that had taken their toll on him through the last several years. And so when the angel tells him, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of, our, out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you, God asked through the angel. Gideon, here's his response. Because of his suffering, he's got this self-pity and this self-doubt. And he says, how can I save Israel? My family is the weakest in my tribe, and I am the weakest one in my family. Now, sometimes when we see where we come from, it can be a, a disadvantage. Gideon's looking at his tribe, and he's like, man, our tribe's the weakest in all Israel, and, and, and my family's the weakest in my tribe, and, and I'm the weakest one in my family, God. Why are you calling me? You know, uh, we're, we're weak people, but, and I'm a weak man. My clan is weak. H have you ever had something shake your confidence in your life, friends? Have you ever felt like you were called up to do something big, something bigger than yourself. I mean, something you'd have to dig deep to, to, to do. And suddenly, you're overcome with feelings of self-doubt. Your confidence is shaken. And instead of facing what you feel like you need to face, you kind of run and hide from those, that opportunity or from the, that problem in your life. Doubting ourselves is a struggle we all deal with at times. And self-doubt often comes from self-pity. Who am I? I can't do that. Look at what I've been through. And those, you know what self-pity and self-doubt are about? They're about self. <laughs> They're about focusing on ourselves. And when we focus on ourselves, we're never going to find the strength to get beyond ourselves and do something bigger than ourselves. The only way we can be part of that is when we take our eyes off ourselves and focus our eyes on God and how big he is. When I focus on God's power and his love, that, that's when I find the power myself to live for something bigger than me. I can live for a cause greater than my own wants and my own needs. Now, according to Judges chapter 7, Gideon ends up defeating the Midianite army with only 300 men. God instructs him to keep winnowing down, winnowing down the, the army until he only has 300 men left. And that army was one of the most feared military forces in the region, the Midianites. So how, can, how could Gideon defeat them with just 300 men? Because he had faith in God who was more powerful than all the armies in the world. God chose Gideon because he wanted to make an example that I can use even your weakness in my strength. And even with a small force, I can defeat the most powerful armies in the world. That's our God's power. Now, look, I know life can really hurt sometimes. Sometimes what we go through, the pain, the difficulties can overwhelm us. And it's easy to begin focusing on our own hurts and our own needs and, and begin to pity ourselves. But then when we take our eyes off ourselves and realize the great lo love God has for us, it can fill us with strength. I love what Romans 8.32 says. Listen to, to these words. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? 
Paul saying there that if God was not with, un, if he was not unwilling to give us his own son, if he was willing to send Jesus, his only begotten son, into the world to die for you, to take your place on the cross so that you might be forgiven, that he could pay the price for your sin. Like if God would show you that kind of love, if he would not withhold his only son for you, what would he withhold? There was, there's nothing more precious to God than that. And he's already given that for you. So what's he going to hold back for you? The love of God is that he wants to graciously give us all things, Paul says. That's the power and love God has for you. So why would we pity ourselves even when we go through difficult times when we know that's the love of God and his power can see us through and if we're faithful to following him, if we have courage to lean into what he's calling us up to, that he can bless us in ways we've never imagined and he can use us in ways that we've never imagined to make a difference for others. See, we cannot live for ourselves when we're trusting ourselves. Or we cannot live for something bigger than ourselves when we're trusting only ourselves. But we can live for something beyond ourselves when we put our faith in God. Faith brings courageous action. James Hewitt once said, Give me a hundred men who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God, and I will shake the world. When we have the courage to lean into what God's calling us to do, whether it's at school or your workplace or in your family or in your neighborhood or in your church, wherever that is, when we have the courage to lean into what God is putting on our hearts individually to do for him or to do for others in his name, when we have the courage to do that, friends, it's powerful. It, it makes a difference. But we have to dig deep. We have to find the courage and that courage comes through faith in God, trusting that he's bigger than whatever obstacle is in front of us. There's another man named in our text here. Maybe you notice the name of Jephthah. You talk about self-doubt. Jephthah, his mother was a prostitute. Man, Jephthah, when he looked at his ancestry, probably felt really bad. You know, this is where I come from. What good am I? Maybe you've had those thoughts in your own life at times. Imagine the mental anguish and the struggles that Jephthah had to overcome. Knowing his family history was a burden. But I want to zero back in on Hebrews 11.34. It says, whose weakness was turned to strength. Whose weakness was turned to strength. When when we talk about faith, we need to understand all of us have our weaknesses. You know, every Superman has a fatal weakness, right? What was Superman's? Well, it was kryptonite. All of us, we have our weak spots. But I, and I love the way that Hebrews chapter 11 lifts up all of these men and women of faith as examples, but all of them had their struggles too, if you read their stories. They wrestled with human weakness. Jephthah could have easily caved in to self-pity and self-doubt because of his ancestry. But instead, he put his faith in the God who had given him a spiritual DNA, a spiritual history, to look back of, of great men and women of faith. And he stood on their shoulders and leaned into an opportunity to make a difference. And wow, what a difference he made in overcoming foreign armies against great odds for the glory of God. The God who promises that in our weakness he is strong is faithful, friends. And when we put our faith in him, we can overcome whatever doubt, self-doubt, or self-pity we might struggle with at times and be able to rise up to do courageous things for his glory. Now, next we see that faith fleshes out with confidence to face enormous odds. Look at what it goes on to say in, in Hebrews 11, verse 33. It says, these were people who through faith shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword. Now, faith leads us to overcoming incredible odds. <laughs> Think of the teenager David who's mentioned here. David, just a shepherd boy, went up against the Philistine giant, their warrior champion, nine feet tall with an armor bearer, and all of his armor, a sword and a javelin. He comes out. And David meets him on the field of battle, just a shepherd boy, no armor, just a sling and five smooth stones. But using what God had put in his hand, the, the young shepherd boy David 
overcomes, overcomes a giant champion warrior. <clears throat> and he did it not trusting in his own strength, but in the strength of the God who had delivered him on those Palestinian hills when he watched a sheep from the bear and the lion. He had seen God do it before, and he knew God could do it again in helping him overcome the odds against him. Faith fleshes out with confidence to face enormous odds. They shut the mouths of lions, it says. Do you know who that's talking about? Daniel. Daniel, who was, who was challenged by the leaders of his day to pray to no other god but simply to the, the, the emperor, the king himself. But Daniel, upon hearing that decree, goes up to his room, throws open the windows to face Jerusalem, bows down in front of everybody to see toward Jerusalem and prays to God three times a day until finally he had to be thrown into the lion's den as an example to be punished. And God shut the mouths of those lions. Daniel was not touched all night in the lion's den because God's power overcomes even the most powerful king, the most fierce adversary. It says there that they quench the fury of the flames. Maybe you remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The king, for very similar purposes, threw them in a furnace of fire. Had the fire heated up seven times hotter than normal and threw them in. And you know what happened? They walked out of those flames, and the Bible says they didn't even have the stench of smoke on their clothes because they trusted in the one who could deliver them. Whether or not he would, that's up to him, they said. But we're going to trust him. And God delivered them. Our God is, he's big enough to deliver whatever the odds are against you, my friends. They escape the edge of the sword. Romans 8, 31 says, if God be for us, who can be against us? God plus, you, plus one, God plus you equals a majority, friends. And we put our faith and our trust in God. We gain the confidence to do whatever God might be calling us to do, however big the obstacles however big the challenges in front of us may be. I'm so thankful for the story of faith of these men and women that, that are in our line. They're, that's our history, believers. These are the people we come from. These are the stories that inspire us to live, all the, to live out God's, God's call in our own lives with courage and confidence, whatever we're facing. This morning, I'm, exci I'm so excited to share with you a huge step of faith that our leaders, our management team and our leaders have taken to put a contract on a, a piece of property in the greater Lake Nona area. I mean, if, if I were to draw a, a, cir a circle, if I were to put a pin in the ideal spot to be in Lake Nona, if you want to reach this community as a church and draw a one-mile radius around that pin, this piece of property would be right in that one-mile radius. It's a very strategic piece of property in terms of its location, about 10 acres, and it's not cheap. But our leaders have stepped out in faith, have a contract on this property. Now, look, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail today because right now that property is in due diligence. Civil engineers are doing their work to see if the soil is going to perk right and all of that. We'll, we're going to update you in six to eight weeks when we get the results of all of the, of the, 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 the due diligence testing done. Okay, we'll give you an update on where we stand. And at that point, share more detail about the story. And I can't wait for you to hear the story about how God provided us, through whom he provided it, how he moves in the lives of his people to do great things when we step out on faith. I can't wait for you to hear that story. I don't know that that story is even mine to tell. There are others in our, conversation, in our congregation that will get the honor to tell that story and should. I can't wait for you to hear it. But today I want you to know that we need you to pray. Because we're, as we're in the midst of this due diligence to try to break through on a piece of ground upon which one day we'll build a church building to provide 24-7 ministry to Lake Nona, we're going to do something that no other church has really been able to do since Lake Nona really has begun to grow. In our whole affinity group serving 100,000 people in the Lake Nona area, we have one other church building. That's it. There was a second one. They just sold their property. They won't be there much longer. And so we have churches and schools, but no 24-7 ministry facility serving the community, the people in Lake Nona. And that's our heart. We want to lift the Lord up by serving this community, reaching out to them, providing a place where kids can come and learn about Jesus, where youth groups can meet through the week, where we can have Bible studies, where we can bring the people together to worship God in an environment that's not setting up and tearing down every Sunday so you can get to know each other rather than just the curtains, 
you know, focus time on people rather than stuff. Boy, what a day that's going to be, right? That day will come, friends. But the first step in that is taking that bold step of saying, God's provided property. We want to go for it. And that's what we're in the midst of. So would you pray for God's provision? Would you pray that God would knock down every obstacle that we face, overcome enormous odds? He already has, but continue to pray that he'll help us overcome enormous odds for his glory and for the good of our community, the good of the people we serve, so that we can see that land come into the possession of his church and ultimately upon that piece of property, a a great church building be built to serve the needs 24-7, spiritual needs in this community. What an exciting thing to get to share with you. So I wish I could give more detail, but we just can't. We've got to wait for it to come in. But would you pray in faith and confidence? And in a few weeks, when the time's right, we'll be able to share with you more detail about this. We come from a long line of faith, my friends. And I'm so glad that the story of incredible faith, uh, faith that overcomes huge obstacles, that trusts God to do things beyond what we could ask or imagine. Like, I'm so glad that we come from a long line of faith like that. Aren't you? That's going to be the story of our church for the generations to come, for our kids and grandkids, for all in this community. That'll be the story of the faith of this church because of what we're involved with and what you're going to have the opportunity to be involved with in the coming days and weeks and months. But it begins with prayer. Prayers of faith to lift this up for God and trust his provision and power to make it happen. Now, I want you to check out one final thing that we see in this passage. Not only does faith flesh out with the courage to do something bigger than ourselves, not only does faith flesh out with the confidence to face enormous odds, but faith fleshes out with the commitment to endure whatever the sacrifice We are people that don't quit. In faith, we endure, we persevere. Look at what it says in verse 35. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Talk about faith. They said, this life is not all there is. I'll pay the price here, but I know what's coming. There's going to be an incredible resurrection one day. Some faced jeers and flogging while others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. These heroes of faith had no guarantee that life was going to go the way they wanted it to. But they had faith that they were doing what they were supposed to be doing for the glory of God. And they left the results to him. And they just pushed on. They had the faith that, that led them to the kind of commitment that would make whatever sacrifice necessary to see God's power prevail. Romans chapter 8 verse 35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. Not life or death or angels or demons, not famine or persecution. There is nothing that can separate you from God's love, friends. Nothing in all of creation can separate us from God. The truth, that truth has inspired millions of people, billions, I would say, of believers throughout the centuries to hold on to faith even when they're suffering, even when they're sacrificing. They hold on. They know nothing can separate me from the love of God. And they don't quit They keep pursuing God's word. They keep pressing on. I know you might be going through some rough times today. You might look back and say, you know, but but one day, I hope you'll be able to look back and say, you know, losing my wife or my husband was the most difficult thing I ever had to deal with. Waves of sadness crushed into my soul. It felt like I was all alone. I didn't know how I would ever make it through. But it was my faith that got me through. I had faith that Jesus Christ would turn my night into day. I had faith that he would help me pick up the pieces of my life. And I have faith that one day I'm going to see my wife or my husband again in heaven. I don't know if that or or whatever else like that that you might be going through, but that kind of faith is the kind of faith that I know God wants you to walk through this life with, not in fear, Not with anxiety or consternation about what's to come, but knowing whatever comes, whatever sacrifice might lay ahead of us, that we can press on through it through his power and for his glory. The old hymn reminds us, faith is the victory that has overcome the world. Now, after we read through this great list of of ancestors, people that we're in this long line of of faith, in Hebrews 11, Abraham and Sarah and Mo- Noah and Moses and Rahab and Daniel, all these we've read about today, we move on to one of the most inspiring verses of Scripture. I want you to check it out. 
Hebrews chapter 12. In light of all this, look at what it says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance. The race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. We are surrounded by all those ancestors of faith and those who've come after them. Maybe your parents or grandparents or a teacher or someone, a coach that, that poured into your life, a person of faith. We're surrounded by these witnesses, God says. It's like you're in the Colosseum running a race, and they're all cheering you on. They're cognizant of what's happening. They're saying, you go. Don't give up now. Don't quit yet. There's a resurrection coming. Just hang on. Don't let anything separate you from God's love. Stay with it. Don't quit. God's got this, and with his strength, you can do it. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, friends. I'm so motivated when I think of that. To think that they're partners with you and me in our own race. And I don't know what your race entails. Your race might be so much more difficult than my race. But whatever is in the race marked out with you, God says, don't quit. Run with perseverance because you are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And you know who's cheering you on right there in front? Jesus Christ, our Lord himself, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the one who had the greatest faith of all, who, who looked down the cross to the other side and saw the joy set before him. So he endured that. He persevered that so he could accomplish what God called him to do and bring us to heaven with him. Jesus is my hero because he gave his life for me. And whatever weakness you might be wrestling with, you can turn it over to God because listen to his promise. In 2 Corinthians 12, he says, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. When I am weak, he is strong. When you feel like you've blown it, friends, when you, when you feel like you've got too many doubts to, to, to make it through, when you feel like you've just indulged too much sin or you've lived for your own pleasure for far too long, let me encourage you, trust God. Hand it to him. Don't let Satan rob you of what God has yet in store for your life. God's power is made complete in weakness. You can overcome all of that through his power at work within you. And it begins as you turn your life over to him today. So I want to encourage you today. Touch your spiritual ancestry. Claim it. Own it. Walk in it. Live a life of epic faith that understands God can forgive you whatever is in your history, whatever is in your history, whoever is in your history. He can empower you to do great thing, things through his power at work within you to make a difference for others. Live a life of epic faith. He can save you from your past. He loves you enough to get what you through whatever you're facing in your present. And he's going to see you all the way through your future into the glory of heaven. If you just hang on, don't quit on him. He'll never quit on you. Let's live out that life as people of faith. We're going to move into this time of communion. I'm going to ask you to pray with me. And then as the song is sung, is sung I'm going to ask you that right where you sit, just to lean into this moment with Jesus. When you came in today, you should have gotten a cup that on one side has a, a cracker and the other side the juice to remind us of Jesus' body crucified and his blood shed. Every believer is invited to share in this moment of faith, this moment of remembrance of what Jesus did for us on the cross, that he endured that to save you out of his love for you. Turn over whatever it is you need to give him and let him fill you and renew you with faith today. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this chance to remember Jesus in this time of communion. Thank you that through Jesus we are connected to an incredible line of faith. Thank you, Lord, that as Randy shared earlier, there's a hole in us if we don't know where we come from, really. But whatever our story physically may be, spiritually, you've given us a family. You've connected us to something even more powerful because we're not just human beings having spiritual experiences. We are spiritual beings having human experiences. God, the spiritual world's real. You've connected us, connected us spiritually to those who've gone before us as people of faith, and we're part of that family. Help us, Lord, to rise up and live out the faith you've called us to. And remind us right here and now as we think about the faith that took Jesus 
when he humbled himself and became a man, when God put on skin and became like us, and though he lived the perfect life, went to that cross to bear my sin and the sin of the world, that he would pay the price for that that we owed so that through his sacrifice we might be healed and forgiven. Help us to remember him, to give him thanks, and to let his strength fill our weakness today so that we can walk out of here as overcomers through your faith. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. What a powerful reminder of who we are as children of God. And as we sing these songs in time of communion, let us remember the identity we have in Christ as children of faith.
Thank you, Lord God, that you are already here and you invite us and you live in us. Oh, Lord, we glorify you to you be everything that we are. Thank you for the reminder today that our DNA in faith is in you and you alone. In Jesus we pray. The church said, amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Thank you all for being here today. I'm going to ask that as we just remain standing for a moment, that if you have any decision on your heart about next steps in your walk with Jesus, maybe you'd like to talk with someone about what it means to make Jesus the Lord of your life, to be baptized into him. We would love to talk with you about that. You can just let us know on that connection card at your seat. Any decision, any prayer need that we can pray with you about, it's a way to connect with us. And you can put it there, just put it in one of the boxes at the back, and we'll follow up with you uh, this week. And we'd love to have that conversation with you. Um, also, if you've come prepared to give tithes and offerings today as part of your worship, you can leave those in the boxes in the back, or you can give online uh, for those of you worshiping online with us as well. And um, as I mentioned that, I want to say thank you to all you who so faithfully given over this last year. Those giving statements will be coming out this week, so you might want to be keeping an eye on your inbox, or maybe it goes to junk mail for some of you. Keep an eye on that so you can look for your giving statements this week. We appreciate your partnership in the gospel to bring the hope of the world to our community and around the world. Uh, one thing I want, a couple things I want to share before we pray today. Uh, one is that in just a few weeks, we're having our chili cook-off, right? February 12th, Super Bowl Sunday. There's sign-up sheets out there. If you want to enter your chili into the competition, bring a crack of that, please sign up. We'd love to taste that. The Boy Scouts are going to be with us to test it or to judge it, I should say again. And um, we hope you'll participate. It's always a lot of fun, fellowship, on Super Bowl Sunday to uh, do our, our Super Bowl of chili cook-off. So I hope you'll be here for that. And then I want to share with you that on, on the table in the back is a, uh, an, a, an elder affirmation ballot. For any of you who are connected with Thrive Church, feel this is your church home. If you're 16 years old or older, if you are a baptized believer in Christ, if you are faithfully part of the, of the body here at Thrive, meaning that you serve and attend and even give regularly, then, uh, then we want to encourage you, please, to... to to prayerfully affirm these elder candidates. God has done such a great job raising these guys up. There's a lot I could say about all five of these men and their families for how they're putting themselves out there in faith and trust in God to serve as part of our very first elder team, which is going to bless the church in, in amazing ways. But I would encourage you, please participate in this. Next week, you'll also have an opportunity to, to participate in this, and then uh, that that'll be will be done with the affirmation process, and um, we'll let you know the results after next Sunday service. Okay, but I encourage you to participate in it, and uh, you'll hear more about me for, about this on Facebook this weekend if you're still curious about what it means. Um, let, let's go to the Lord together in prayer. It's been good to be together. I've gone a little bit over today, so thanks for your patience. But what that means is our setup team's a little bit behind the gun on getting out of here on time. So if you can hang out for a few more minutes and help tear down some chairs or put up some curtains, I know the setup team would appreciate your help in that. But let's bow together, let's pray, and then let's go and be the church to the people around us that so desperately need Jesus. Now unto him who is able, able to do more, than we ask or even imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. In his name we pray, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.